Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 through 8. And if you'll stand for the reading of uh, God's word. And in your church Bible there, it's on page 611, if you'd like to pull it up and, and read together. This is the Lord's comfort for Zion. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden. Her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving in the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Let's pray. Father, we worship you. We know that you alone are God. You are holy and righteous, and everything you do is good. We are so grateful to be called by your name that you've exchanged our hearts of wickedness into holy and righteous hearts that seek you, Lord God, by your great salvation and sacrifice. Father, I pray this day that as we come to your word, that you'll expand our minds and hearts to understand what you're telling us, Lord Jesus. Uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity to delve into your word. I pray for everyone here, Lord Jesus, for every single person, Lord God, that their hearts will be right with you. And if there's anything that's blocking, Lord God, that you, by your grace and mercy, Lord Jesus, will lead them into holiness, repentance, and righteousness, Lord God. By your grace and mercy, I ask, and in your holy name, Lord Jesus, amen. I do not um, pick the children's story ahead of time. Um, we go whatever's next. And a lot of times I don't even um, read it ahead of time because uh, I've read these books. But I, I always like to be excited and surprised. And I don't believe I could have picked any better introduction than the words, uh, the four questions uh, that the children's story asks. Do I need to fear the future? What if my life takes a wrong turn? What if my dreams don't come true? What if I make too many mistakes? People of God were in a position where they waiting for them was excruciating. As it says in the book of Proverbs, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Waiting is never easy. In fact, it rather can be rather excruciating, yet the best way to wait for the provision of God in the future is to look back and remember what God has done in the past. We are a forgetful bunch, uh, and we have to be deliberate to remember what God has done. Otherwise, we all too often fail, fall into the hopelessness of despair. And this is where we find Israel teetering on the precipice of despair uh, as they look upon their city, their beloved city of David, Jerusalem, that's laying in ruins. 
in ruins because of pillaging armies who have come. It's in ruins because of the neglect of disuse as the people have been brought into exile and because of the decay of time uh, that has uh, run down their city. And the question becomes, has David's once great city uh, been turned into a heap of ruins in a lonely wilderness forever? Yet in the midst of their circumstances, in their suffering, in their uh, confusion about what the future held, God, whose creative power fashioned a people using Abraham and Sarah in days of old, could once again restore his people and the nation in the city to greatness. But, what? They must wait on him. And so my big idea this morning is this, simply this, the promises of God are the comfort of the righteous. The promises of God are the, pro- are the comfort of the righteous. Therefore, as we wait, we can choose hope over despair. We can choose justice over chaos And we can choose what is eternal over what is fleeting. Hope over despair, justice over chaos, eternal over fleeting, because the promises of God are the comfort of the righteous. Promises of God are the comfort of the righteous. I'll leave that point up for you as you take notes. And we'll turn our attention to verses 1 and 2. Listen, Isaiah says... By the power of the Holy Spirit, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn, to the quarry which you were dug. Go back to the beginnings when the Lord called you out. Look to Abraham, your father, the father of many nations, the father of the Jews. Look to Sarah who bore you, the mother, his wife, the wife of promise. For he was but one when I called him, that I may bless him and multiply him. God promised in Isaiah 50, we saw last week the third servant servant song, that God's servant, his chosen, would rise up to deliver his people from bondage to freedom. And he called them to trust him. But look at verse 10, this continued, or verse of chapter 50, just a few verses earlier. Who among you fear the Lord and obeys the voice of the servant? Let him who walks in what? Darkness and has no light, what? Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. See, it's not all sunshine and rainbows when you listen to the voice of God and trust him. Often you will have to walk in the darkness when you cannot see, when you don't know where you're going. And if you ever tried that, I remember at camp, in Camp Northfield, we, uh, when I was a little boy, we'd go out into the forest and chief would turn off the lights and all of it, it was pitch black and we couldn't see anything. And he's like, okay, you have to work your way over this tree stump or this fallen tree. And it wasn't pretty. Uh, Because we couldn't see where we're going. We had to rely on one another. But God, through Isaiah, is calling his people to trust the servant who is leading you, not through uh, the tulips and not tiptoeing through the tulips and and, uh, rainbows and unicorns, but through the rocky soil. When the path is dark, when the way is not easy to be seen. But the difference as the people walk is the difference between hope and despair. And what is the difference? Often our memory. Our ability to remember God's faithfulness. Our ability to remember what God has already done. He was faithful in his promises to Abraham. And Isaiah tells the people today as they're waiting on the promises of God, he will be faithful now because Abraham was as good as dead as Ernie read for us. Paul says, in hope, he, Abraham, believed against hope 
that he should be the father of many nations. So, um, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. We often, as Christians today, go back to the scriptures. We go back to church history, and we see the faithfulness of God, and we say the God who was faithful in the past can be faithful now. And Isaiah does the same thing. In Genesis, he call, comes to Abraham, who is a childless man, and he promises him that he would be the father of many nations. But the twist is that Abraham is in the twilight of his life. He's 75 years old. And his wife, Sarah, is 65 years old. And when Abraham tells Sarah, she justifiably laughs because she's 65. She's two and a half decades past childbearing years. Hearing such a promise was ridiculous enough at 75 and 65. But here's the rub. God says... You're going to wait, and you're going to wait 25 more years. Let me give you, you put, you know, like, well, that's a long time. Let me put that into perspective. It would be as if the Lord came to my parents, my mom and dad right here, and they said, uh, my dad got a vision and said, uh, Jim, you're going to have another son. But in the year 2048, we would be fitting my father for this nice white jacket with these padded walls because we're like, that's just silly. The Lord doesn't do that. That's not how it goes. However, as we can see, God's promises are not rooted in what is plausible or what we even think is possible, but God's promises are rooted in his goodness, his power, and his faithfulness. Isaiah is calling God's people to find comfort for the present and ultimately for the future by remembering what God has already done in the past. The God who created a many people from a 100-year-old man and his barren 90-year-old wife is the same God who would restore the barren city of Jerusalem and he is the same God who provides for the needs of his people in the 21st century and beyond. Therefore, we can wait on our good and faithful God. But if any, you're anything like me, waiting is not easy. I'm a type A. I like to be in control. I like to be, have everything just wait. And when waiting, it's not easy for me and it's not natural for me because I don't want to relinquish control. But to wait on our God, who's good and he's powerful and he's sovereign, we must trust in his goodness as he walks us down this path that we cannot see where we're going. And we have to trust the servant who loves us and cares for us. We have to trust the power of God. He's able to do what he's promised. He's not like those boys in Tom Sawyer who made all these promises and all these threats and they could do nothing about it. It's not like the, we also have to trust the wisdom of God when we say, I don't think this is the right way. There are so many more people on that path over there. Why are we going on this, this narrow path that I don't understand where we're going? Even when it feels downright silly, we can trust a God who is good and powerful and faithful and wise. Notice verse 3, as we choose hope over despair, for the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the voice of song. God promises to all who trust in him, who seek his righteousness by faith in Jesus, will find blessing, not cursing. Cursing. 
We'll find fullness, not emptiness. We'll find fellowship, not rejection. But it's not an instantaneous return. Sometimes the Lord instantaneously works in our lives. Sometimes it's the slow process of sanctification. He has to get us down, break us down to where he wants us before he builds us back up because we too much fight against him and work according to what we think. In the scope of eternity, waiting and the times that we wait are but a vapor. But in the moment as we wait, it feels like an eternity. And this is where Isaiah is. He is comforting his people on the brink of despair and he's calling them to hope. A hope that trusts in the promises of God that he is not willing to let his people receive the just results of the sin of their sin, but to bring them into fellowship and restore what sin has broken and stolen and destroyed. And in the end, we see in verse 3, the fellowship that we hope for, that we wait for, will be like the Garden of Eden where God's people and whose hearts overflow with joy and gladness, thanksgiving and song, though at times we have to wait and choose hope over despair because our God is good and he's powerful and he is faithful. And his promises are the comfort of those who seek his righteousness. Therefore, we can choose hope over despair. We can choose justice over chaos. We live in a day and age when the cries for justice have been made popular by activist groups and hashtags and various protests. Words like equality, oppression, and love are buzzwords that advance countless agendas on behalf of particular groups and ideologies. And it's often what is lost in the contemporary uh, culture wars that we label progressive or conservative, secular or religious, is the fact that many of these things are profoundly biblical and derived from a Christian worldview. However, these words have been redefined and what they're packaged with, even when they're properly defined, can make a profound difference for those who are seeking righteousness and seeking the truth. And so Isaiah, as we turn here, said, give attention to me. Pay attention. Listen. Like, just like verse 1, just like verse, uh, I think it's verse 7. Listen. Give attention to me. Listen. Give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice as a light to the people. The Hebrew word for justice is the realization of God's design and his order for his creation. The opposite of justice is not injustice, though it's part of the scope of understanding. The opposite of justice in the, New Te- or the Old Testament is chaos. Or, as the book of Judges says, Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. If you've read through the Old Testament, and you've seen when people did what was right in their own eyes, what they thought was good and just and right, it produced a harvest of curses and pain and bitterness. To pursue justice, according to the kingdom of God, according to the heart of God, means to pursue God's design for a world that is corrupted and twisted by man's iniquity and and transgressions, both conservatives and progressive, secular and and religious. And God's justice, his aim, is to make crooked paths straight, and to mend what has been broken according to his law and to his righteousness, not according to the conservatives or the progressives, to the secular or to the religious. God's promises of his justice, his design, his order for his creation will serve as a light to the nations 
and be a reminder that God is doing something that is bigger than just bringing Israel back from exile. He is restoring his justice, his order, his way, his righteousness in his creation. How is he doing that? Through the power of his servant. Notice um, the first servant song that talks about the servant who is to come. We understand this to be Jesus. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till what? He has established justice, God's design and order in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law, his instruction, his design to be taught. That we see at the end in the New Testament, and he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This week I, I stood before a man who had just passed, and I read, read the promises of Revelation 21. There will be no weeping and crying and tears, and death will be no more. Why? Because God is making all things new. He is bringing justice to the earth, making all things the way he has designed, and restoring what we have twisted and perverted and, and uh, our more inf- uh, moral fallenness and our faithlessness and our uh, promises. See, the servant will not just pass judgment on the sins of this people, but he will bring God's creation back into alignment uh, according to his law and his righteousness. And honestly... At the bottom of our hearts, though we rebel against God's way and we say we want things our way, this is what the human heart craves. Verse 5, my righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out. My arms will will judge the peoples. And notice here, the coastlands, the nations that are far away from Israel, they hope for me, and my arm, they wait. At the heart of mankind is a longing for the justice of God. I I believe that's why there's so many calls for justice throughout the centuries, is because, and and, uh, many of those good, many of them Uh, Not good, many of them flawed. But at the heart of mankind is a desire for justice. We want somebody who is strong enough and good enough to rule in justice, to do what is right. Think about it. How many times have you been angered, despaired, or discouraged when you turn on the TV, when you open the history books, and you see rulers and kingdoms and those in power who have perverted justice, twisted truth, and oppressed the weak? Lenin and Stalin's Iron Curtain, Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge, Hitler's Third Reich, Mao's Cultural Revolution, Andrew Jackson's Trail of Tears, American Slavery and Jim Crow Laws. How many times have you turned on the television and the evening news and turned it off because it was only murder and oppression and corruption? The chaos of this world overwhelms us and we grow angry when we see uh, elderly people taken advantage of. We grow angry when we see children abused. We grow angry when we see spiritual abuse from the pulpit, from people who say, thus saith the Lord, but they're only serving their own bellies. We want someone with the power to throw off the tyranny of chaos. We want someone good enough to overrule the evil governments and oppressive powers. We want justice. But the problem is we're looking for justice in all the wrong places. We turn to conservative values and progressive ideals. We conserve the wrong things and we progress the, the, the wrong things. Political outsiders and social media influencers, Supreme Court justices and constitutional amendments and executive orders. We want wealth and beauty, power, fame, education and legislation to bring justice. And many of these things are good things that we as Christians, we who want the justice of the kingdom of God to be, uh, to be continued, to be involved in these things. We want, at the heart of it, 
a Superman who can bring truth, justice in the American way. We want someone powerful enough to save us, but Isaiah says the answer we long for has already gone out. Verse 5, my righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out. My arms will judge the peoples. John Oswald, one of the commentaries I, I often read, put it like this, and I didn't want to change it. Here's the truth God has been trying to get his people to hear throughout the book. It is the power of self-denial. It is the power of self-sacrifice. It is the power of innocence. It is the power of faithfulness. It is the power of holy love. In other words, it is the power of the servant. It is the power of Jesus Christ. The promise of Jesus Christ alone is able to deliver us from the chaos of sin in our hearts, in our families, in our society, in our churches, in our worlds. The question, Ocean Park, is will you listen? Will you trust in Jesus Christ the servants. Notice verse 6. He says, lift up your eyes to the heaven. He says, step I want you to. I want you to see something. You're not going to believe the view that you're about to see. Listen. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth before you. For the heavens vanish like smoke and the earth will wear out like a garment. And they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But, check this out. Look at the beauty of God's salvation that lasts forever. And his righteousness will never be dismayed. Look how beautiful that is. When God's justice comes to earth and, and, and it sets things right, look at it. Take a picture, share it on social media, pull it up and show it. This is beautiful. Isaiah's vision is of God's eternal kingdom, a kingdom of justice and righteousness. His vision is so clear and so bright, and I pray that we, as we see this, will see the clearness and get a glimpse of Jesus' kingdom, and it will stir a passion in our hearts to go and tell the good news of the servant who has come to set things right by his self-sacrificial love. And it was working to bring true biblical justice that all of our hearts design. A kingdom of justice and righteousness that will never fail, that will never be overthrown, that will never default. It's a final, st even when the farthest star in the galaxy explodes into a superna uh, supernova, God's kingdom of justice and righteousness remains. When the highest mountain is scattered like dust in the wind, God's righteous and just kingdom remains. When the greatest superpower is but a footnote in the page of human history, God's kingdom remains. Or as the psalmist says, of old you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hand. They will perish. Though they're powerful now, though they're steadfast now, though they feel immovable now, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you, O oh God, O oh faithful one, the servant who is called to bring salvation and justice to the earth are the same. And your years have no end. Brothers and sisters, today the nations rage. But like the stars that fade and the earth that wears out, their power will end when they inevitably succumb to death. But God's kingdom remains. And Isaiah is calling God's people to see a vision of justice and righteousness that is secured by his servant Jesus Christ. But if only they wait for the justice that Christ brings for his kingdom in the midst of the chaos of the world that eats and gnaws at our hearts. And as we wait with hope 
over despair, seeking the justice of the kingdom over the chaos of this world, the promises of God bring comfort to the righteous. And then we look to the eternal over the fleeting. For a third time, Isaiah calls the people to listen to his words. Verse 1, listen. Verse 4, pay attention. Verse 7, listen to me. You who know righteousness, the people in whom hard is my law, fear not the reproach of men. If you wait, if you seek the justice of God, reproach is coming. Nor be dismayed at their reviling. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever in my salvation to the generations. Isaiah is speaking to those who feel the heaviness of despair and the longing for justice and therefore have turned and responded and trusted in the promises of God. These are the people that have internalized the promises and the hope of the servant and the righteousness of God. They have see, sought him. He's speaking to them who knows God's promises to be true. He's speaking to them who are being shaped by God's justice, his order, his way. Speaking to those who have aligned their life according to God's law, who are deeply committed to his ways. Though imperfectly, they're seeking to follow the servant. And Isaiah warns them. And while he warns them, he also encourages them. You will face reproach. You will face reviling. Opposition on this path as we follow the servant, opposition is inevitable. However, God's people can endure. Because the fleeting mockery of those who call you a fool for believing in the future, future natural, they'll fade. The scorn of those who call you silly for trusting in legends and fairy tale, they will be swept away by the sands of time. The ridicule of believing in an unseen God and a crucified Christ, they will be wiped away like all the nations and the kingdoms and the people before them. God, but people must remember his promises are faithful and his kingdom is eternal. The scorn of the crowds will fade. The slander will eventually grow silent. The insults will be forgotten on this dark path that we walk. But God's righteousness and his salvation will never end. But that doesn't mean the path is easy. That doesn't mean the interim as we hope is easygoing. Verse again, chapter 50, verse 10. Who among you fear the Lord and obeys the voice of the servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. If you trust in God's servant, Jesus Christ, those who oppose Jesus will oppose you. Matthew, in Matthew, Jesus says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. How often when others revile us, persecute you, and, and uh, evil, uh, do, you, do you bless, and you're thankful? We usually go on, on Twitter and, and rip them, or we tell them, and we get angry, or we put in a complaint because people persecute us. But Jesus says you're blessed, rejoice. John 15, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. All who seek and wait for God's salvation, his law, his righteousness. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If, you kept, if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. The power of those who oppose Christ and his people will feel terrifying. And the str their strength will seem infinite. How could we possibly go against them? But they are not. Time will slowly eat away at the greatest of the powers like a moth. And on the garment 
uh, on a, a moth on a garment or the worm, a worm in cotton. But time only proves the faithfulness of the promises of God. So do not lose heart, Paul tells us. Though out, our outer self is wasting away as we wait on the promises of the Lord to be fulfilled. Our inner self is being renewed day by day for this, what? Light, momentary affliction. Though we walk that path in the darkness, it doesn't always feel light. And it doesn't feel momentary. It feels like this will last forever. And it is, a great, is preparing us for the eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. We have no idea how great the glory of God's justice and righteousness in his kingdom will be. And as we look not to the things that are seen, the words that are heard, the posts that are made, the laws that are enacted, but to the things that are unseen, the promises of a God who is good and wise and powerful. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporary, they're fleeting, But the things that are unseen, like the kingdom of God and his promises and the completed work of his son, are eternal. Amen? As we will sing in a moment, though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. So I will not fear, though this truth remains, that my God is the ancient of days. Though the dread of, through the dread of night overwhelms my soul, here, he is here with me. I am not alone. Oh, his love is sure and he knows my name, for my God is the ancient of days. None above him, none before him, all of time is in his hands. For his throne it shall remain eternally. It's not fleeting and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name, for my God is the ancient of days. Today the nations rage in fleeting pride. They seek their kingdom and their ways, but like the stars that fade and the earth that wears out, their power will be carried away like sand in the outgoing tide. But God's eternal kingdom will remain. Ocean Park, as we fix our eyes on God's eternal kingdom, we do not need to fear the fleeting kingdoms of this world that rise and fall like sand castles between the, pri- the, the tides because the promises of God are the comfort of his righteousness. We can hope, have hope over despair. We can seek justice over chaos. We can uh, uh, trust what is eternal over what is fleeting. And Ocean Park, as we wait for the future. There are struggles and trials of the kingdom that this world uh, uh, that we face and deep desires that are unique to our own. Abraham and Sarah longed for a child. The exiles who living far from home longed for a place in David's city again, their own city. All of us long for something. Some of you Struggle with a longing for a Christian spouse to share your life with. Others long for your, uh, for your spouse to share, that you share life with to be a believer. Some of you long for the Lord would give you a child to hold in your arms. Others long for a, your child to overcome the challenges and the vices and the waywardness of their heart. Some of you long for the peace in your marriage and at your work and in other relationships. Others long for a friend, a job, or a place where they can belong. Some of you long for physical healing or financial security or emotional peace. And others of you long for the rest in your body, love in your hearts, and peace in your minds. All of us have unique longings that weigh on our heart and fill our minds. Why? Because we live in a world that feels the effects, the brokenness of sin, the moral failure, the iniquity that twists the goodness of God, the transgressions which are broken trust in relationships. But we are not without hope in a world that is broken, in a world that is not the way it's supposed to be. We have the promises of God. 
And for those who know God and seek God, dive into this book that opens up and reveals like a window the heart of God. Promises of God, just a few, in Romans chapter 8 as we close. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness as we feel the struggles of this world, for we don't know what to pray as we ought. Like standing by the casket of your loved one and all you can do is sigh. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Not all things are good. But God in his sovereignty is working and using even our brokenness in this broken world for our good, for those who are called by his promises. And who shall bring any charge against God's elect? uh, This rhetorical question, the answer is no one. If God has justified, who can condemn us? No one. Jesus Christ is the one who died more than that. He's the one who's raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding, praying for us. God, the Son, is praying to God the Father on our behalf as God the Spirit prays for us in our hearts unto God the Father as well. For I am sure of the promises of God that neither death nor life, angels or rulers, things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, or depth, nor anything, all the things that you struggle with, all the brokenness, all the disappointments, nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God in the servant, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ocean Park, no matter the longings of your heart, and the struggles in your life, you have the promises of God. These four promises that you can meditate and study and be filled with the rest of your life. But we have all the promises of God that have been secured for us by the servant who died, who rose, who ascended, who has sat down at the right hand of the Father, and who is coming again. Therefore, As we read these things, do I need to fear the future? No. What if my life takes a wrong turn? No, I don't need to fear. I can hope. What if my dreams don't come true? I can seek the justice of God over the chaos. What if I make too many mistakes? Jesus paid it all. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is the tree of life. The promises of God that are fulfilled today, tomorrow, and for all eternity will give us life abundantly because of Jesus. Promises of God, therefore, comfort those who seek. Promises of God are the comfort of the righteous who have by faith trusted and been united to Jesus. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and we confess that we live in a world that is broken by sin, moral failure, iniquity where we we have twisted your goodness and your righteousness, your laws and your ways, and we have created a world of chaos and confusion. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. Father, you are good, and your love endures forever, and your power was made manifest in the self-sacrifice of your son, the servant, who died to take the wrath of our, um, uh, of our sin, and who lives and gives us his life. And Father, as we come to the table, we come as those who recognize our sin and our unworthiness, and our deserved judgment, and our condemnation, and we confess that we cannot do anything to uh, be able to escape that. But Father, we also come to the table as people that say, Jesus paid it all. 
Jesus is the one who has taken the punishment on himself and he gives us his life that we can stand before the Father and say, I belong to Jesus. He is my only hope in life and death. And nothing that uh, comes to me in my life, nothing that touches me is outside my Father's will and I trust him because I belong to his Son. And Father, as we share this meal together as a family, it is a foretaste of the great meal that we will have in the new heavens and new earth. And we will praise our God of righteousness and justice who has set back things right according to his law by the completion of the mission of his son, Jesus Christ. And he has called us to himself And we have trusted and followed in faith and repentance. Father, we love you and we trust you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.